Thank you, Eric, and good evening, everyone. Um, having been told very sternly that I had 10 minutes, I'd like to just add perhaps another one to say that I, it's a real privilege, actually, to have been asked by the Whitlam Institute um, both to be able to publish the paper, because it was initially written just for my colleagues on the Human Rights Council to inform us all better about the issues. Um, so it's gone from there to publication and now to this evening. And as I said, I feel it's a real privilege to be part of it. So I thank the university and the Whitlam Institute for that. Of course, it's now almost four years exactly since the Northern Territory intervention was announced by Minister Malbruff on the 21st of June 2007. There's been a change of government and modification of many of the most controversial issues raised by the intervention. But as we've seen recently, attitudes to the intervention remain polarised, contingent on a debate about human rights and their practical meaning. From the beginning and at the heart of the debate was the intervention suspension of the Racial Discrimination Act and its imposition of drastic and blanket measures to address issues of violence, child sexual abuse and dysfunction in remote Aboriginal communities. Much of the opposition to the intervention was to the process of its implementation, particularly to the suspension of the Racial Discrimination Act. In my view, these arguments about process rather than about the need for or the effectiveness of the government's measures have set up an unnecessary and counterproductive opposition between the key objectives of the intervention on the one hand and human rights on the other. Because I think there can be little doubt about the need for action. The extent of the problems in remote communities had been graphically identified, not only in Anderson and Wilde's The Little Children Are Sacred report, but in a series of very confronting reports in different parts of the country dating back from, for more than a decade. The common themes in all these reports were the alarming extent of the problems and the role of alcohol, the urgency of the need for government intervention to solve them, and the centrality of involving Aboriginal people themselves in working together with government and others in the process. The common theme in assessments of the intervention over the four years since then has been the failure of that final requirement, that is the participation of Aboriginal people in working to solve the problems. So there are three points I'd like to make in relation to the issues of human rights. One is that as we know, human rights are a hard won and very precious historical and international achievement that remain vulnerable, even in liberal democracies like Australia. At the same time, any discussion of human rights will always require a balancing act, as the Human Rights Commissioner, Catherine Branson, says. The practical application of human rights law is only rarely about absolutes. It's, often, it's more often about balancing rights, different rights with one another, with responsibilities and with competing public interests. In the case of the intervention, its measures conform to the requirements of the International Convention on the Rights of the Child and the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. In large part, they actually conform also with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that sets out that states shall take measures in conjunction with Indigenous peoples to ensure that Indigenous women and children enjoy the full protection and guarantees against all forms of violence and discrimination. But they do infringe the human rights principles embodied in the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and of Australia's Racial Discrimination Act. It's a moot point. Um, but one that as a non-lawyer I'm prepared to argue that it actually wasn't necessary to suspend the Racial Discrimination Act in order to affect the intervention. But I think the time for that discussion has probably passed. The second point relates to the distinction between substantive and participatory rights, with consultation and informed consent constituting participatory rather than substantive rights. This isn't to diminish their importance, but it does clarify their place in the overall context of the proper role of governments in providing for and protecting people. And as Nick Peterson actually pointed out to me when he gave me comments on the draft of my paper, 
the Northern Territory Land Councils didn't come out of consultation with Aboriginal people. They were an, an initiative of the federal government and in that sense they were imposed and we know what an important role they've played subsequently um, in the Northern Territory and beyond. My third point relates to this question of participatory rights and the meaning of consultation and informed consent. We've had more than four decades of relentless consultation. In fact, you know, it's been said that Aboriginal people have been consulted to death, and yet the statistics remain dire. There are a number of critiques suggesting why this is so. One is that much of the consultation has been a Clayton's consultation, with visiting ministers and bureaucrats operating on a fly-in, fly-out basis, as though they were miners up in the Pilbara, really. Um, another one, pursued by commentators like Gary Johns, Helen Hughes and Keith Winshuttle, is that the policy of self-determination is a failure and should be rejected. This ignores that the implementation of self-determination by Australian governments has consisted of what a colleague has called a dump and run exercise, rather than that of effective practical engagement. Yet another assumption is that informed consent means unanimous consent, which is an unrealistic goal in any society, not just in Aboriginal society. But the effect is that waiting for informed consent on that basis to be achieved is indeed like waiting for Godot and an excuse for inaction. So in responding to the question posed by Peter Sutton in his book uh, as to why what he calls the liberal consensus on Indigenous policy since the 1970s has apparently failed, I'd like to suggest three principal explanatory strands. These are first structural government disengagement, secondly the paradigm of Aboriginal people as victims, and thirdly the encounter between Aboriginal traditional culture and modernity. First, the issue of structural government disengagement, and for an extended argument about this, I'd refer you to the 2007 book by Michael Dillon and Neil Westbury, Beyond Humbug, and to a project currently being carried out by Desert Knowledge on governance in remote Australia. Dillon and Westbury in their book identify remote Australia as a failed state. Among other reasons for this, they cite the bewildering numbers and complexity of government policies, programs and organisational structures, the constant change in that, and the um, increased use of outsourcing. They conclude that this leads to implementation incapacity, or to use phrases employed by the Desert Knowledge Project, policy turbulence, which simply becomes policy nonsense. Secondly, the paradigm of Indigenous people as victims of colonisation and dispossession. This, of course, isn't to deny the impact on Indigenous people of these events, but it's not wholly defining. Indigenous people are not only victims in this situation, but also agents, acting in ways that accord with their own understandings of the world. Noel Pearson has been one of the many Aboriginal people, but he's been at the forefront of challenging the victim paradigm, including in his groundbreaking paper in 2000, Our Right to Take Responsibility. Moreover, Indigenous Australians have achieved significant moral and practical bargaining power on the basis of a range of rights, including but by no means confined to land rights and native title rights. And I think, I think it's instructive to look at recent Indigenous films and their representation of Indigenous life. Samson and Delilah, Brand New Day, Mad Bastards, and very recently Here I Am, which is not yet in commercial cinemas, but I highly recommend it. Um, all of which deliberately challenge the victim paradigm. Thirdly, there's the crucial dimension of the encounter between Aboriginal traditional culture and modernity. Contrary to the view of Aboriginal societies as wholly shattered by colonisation and dispossession, the literature identifies a range of persistent values and practices that continue to inform both Aboriginal social life and action in the intercultural space. This is true across the country, but particularly relevant in remote Australia. Change and adaptation in Aboriginal societies of itself isn't novel, 
despite the projection in Aboriginal discourse itself of Aboriginal culture as unchanging. The difference since colonisation is the extent and rapidity of change. Nevertheless, a crucial question is the extent to which practices that were previously adaptive have become maladaptive, manipulated and distorted, and the role of alcohol in this, with alcohol deeply implicated in, this, in the production and reproduction of these problems. There's time today to take just one example of other dilemmas created by a necessary engagement for Indigenous people in modern Australia. This arises from what's been referred to as the ordered anarchy of traditional political authority. Traditionally, authority is decentered with large landholding groups made up of alliances of smaller groups of various types with overlapping memberships, which are contextual rather than fixed, rather than fixed in time and space, and which exist for certain purposes at certain times. In other words, authority is differentially based on differing rights and responsibilities. The hierarchy in Aboriginal traditional social organisation is age and gender related, situational, located in ceremony, in knowledge and in, in restrictions on the dissemination of knowledge. And it defines the right to speak for country and to be involved in decision making processes. Authority within this hierarchy is held by individuals, but it isn't exercised individually. It has legitimacy and is exercised only in relation to relevant others in the group, relevance again being determined by each situation. It's proved difficult to match this fluidity of hierarchy and authority with Western notions of institutional representation and rationality. And if people have been following the recent um, debates over the Browse Basin development in the Kimberley at James Price Point, um, and in also in Western Australia, but in the Pilbara, um, the very heated and difficult situation between Injibandi people and Fortescue Metals, both are dramatic instances of the dilemmas that arise as a result of this mismatch. The question then is, where to from here? It's clear that some big mistakes were made in the intervention. But as another anthropologist, Francesca Merlin observed, whatever else the intervention did, it established a boundary, a moment beyond which an earlier situation was declared intolerable and a move was demanded towards something else. The reinstatement of the Racial Discrimination Act is necessary but not sufficient. The something else has to be in partnership and a real, not a gammon partnership, and demands the willing participation of Aboriginal people to be sustainable. Some of the ways in which this can happen are set out in the papers produced by the five-year Indigenous Community Governance Project that was undertaken by Reconciliation Australia and the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research at the Australian National University. Central to all those findings is the need for active engagement and support by governments not control and compliance. But I'll give the last word to Noel Pearson, who argues that Indigenous cultures can adapt just like any other. In a 2006 opinion piece in the Age newspaper, he argued, and I quote, minorities have the right to agreements with the central power about securing the survival of their identity and political rights. The Australian minority peoples until recently had a pre-modern culture and no connection with the world economy. To secure Aboriginal economic development, it might be necessary for us to make far-reaching concessions to the dominant culture. Aboriginal Australian culture and economy have changed and must change. The extreme crises in Aboriginal Australia make non-Indigenous Australians and our political leaders lose sight of the natural ultimate goal, which is that Aboriginal Australians become a prosperous, constitutionally recognised first world national minority. Thank you.